Are you stuck on which M1 MacBook Air to buy? Welcome to my completely benchmark free, super simple guide to picking the right M1 MacBook Air for you. Welcome back to Mark Ellis Reviews and thank you as always for subscribing if you have. If you haven't, you know exactly what to do. If there's one thing I've learned over the last few weeks covering all of the M1 MacBook stuff that's been floating around is that it's proving very difficult for people to choose between the, the M1 MacBook Pro and the M1 MacBook Air. I totally get why. Apple have made some very odd decisions, I think, in terms of the way they have presented both of those laptops to the market. So I thought, well, let's try and make this a little bit easier for you. This is my M1 MacBook Air buyer's guide. I'm also making guides for the M1 MacBook Pro and the M1 Mac Mini. So I will add those to the description of this video once they become available in the next few days. If you're swaying towards the Air, there's a reason for that, but there's equally a reason why it might not be the right computer for you. But I'm gonna try and clear it up for you and hopefully save you a bit of money and point you in the direction of a computer that is gonna last you an awfully long time. So. Let's get on with it. How do you choose between the M1 MacBook Air and the M1 MacBook Pro? Now, obviously you've reached this video because you're clearly interested in the Air. And just to kind of round off whether or not that's the right decision, I think there's five questions you can ask yourself. The first one is, what's your workload like? The second one is, do you want or need the touch bar? Third is, how mobile are you? Fourth is whether or not you work outside a lot. And the fifth is just, do you want a MacBook Air? which is fine, by the way. Now I explain the reason for these questions in another video, which I will pay, place a link to up here somewhere. But basically what it comes down to in, in summary to save you watching the video is if you don't have any interest in the touch bar, if those two hours of additional battery life that you get from the M1 MacBook Pro don't really matter, the, the battery on the M1 MacBook Air is fantastic. And lastly, if you don't really undertake processor intensive workflows like really heavy video editing, programming, music production and that kind of stuff, although the Air can do that to a degree. If those three things don't really bother you, the M1 Air is fine. If any one of those three things matters to you, you have to go for the M1 MacBook Pro, simple as that. Now the seven core versus eight core GPU. So when you first go to spec up a M1 MacBook Air, it will give you two options to begin with. One of them is that, well, they both have the eight core CPU, that's just standard. But one of them will have a seven core graphics processor and the other one will have an eight core graphics processor. Now, lots of people in the comments from my previous videos have said, what's the difference between seven and eight core for the GPU. Now for me personally, I'm a video editor. I've used both. I have a Mac mini, M1 Mac mini with the eight core GPU and a M1 Mac book air with a seven core GPU. And I'm not joking. I do not notice a single difference between the two in terms of graphics. Now I don't do any gaming. So unless you're really going to get into gaming, in which case I would go and look at some of the videos and just get some idea from people who know much more about that than me. But in general, everyday use, the seven core versus eight core thing isn't a thing. Now, the, this is where the pricing gets quite interesting. So if you go with the base spec like I did, it's $999 or 999 pounds, and that gets you the seven core GPU. If you want to upgrade to the eight core GPU, you pay $1,249. Now, what Apple also give you for that is 512 gig of storage versus 256 gig of storage. But it's a bit of a premium because if you take the base model, so that $999 model, and add the 512 storage, that actually comes out to 1199. So you're saving yourself 50 pounds just by not having that additional one core of the GPU. That is my advice. If you want the 512 storage, just pick the base level with the seven core GPU, add your storage, done. You'll save yourself $50. You can spend that on something else. It's really not worth sweating the detail with this seven core, eight core GPU thing. I genuinely believe that. If you, if you disagree with me, please let me know in the comments and then explain why, because that might help people. But my experience of having used both configurations there's no difference whatsoever. Save yourself $50. Now, eight gig versus 16 gig, it's a bit of a perennial argument slash debate that people are having about this at the moment. In my view, and again, I use both. I, I have an eight gigabyte M1 MacBook Air and I have a 16 gigabyte M1 Mac Mini. Now I spoke about this recently in my three week experience video of the M1 Mac Mini. And basically that's got 16 gig of RAM. And during the day I, edit videos, I do general stuff, you know, email, Teams calls, a bit of Photoshop editing, Lightroom, all sorts of things. And I've got to the point now where I just leave things open. I just leave apps open. I don't really tend to close stuff like I used to. And the reason for that is that iStat menus, which tells me how much memory and stuff is, is still available. It very rarely, this machine, this Mac mini, goes above eight gig of RAM. 
in terms of usage, there's always at least 50% available, which to me says the 16 gig, you're getting an awful lot of headroom there. For most people, for 95% of M1 MacBook Air users, that will be absolutely adequate. I've edited 4K video on mine, no problem at all. A little bit slower than the, the Mac Mini, but not, not, not noticeably really. Unless you want that just peace of mind that you've got the, the top spec in terms of RAM. Go with the 8 gig. I think really, if you're worried about an intensive workload of really pushing this, this MacBook Air, probably say go for the M1 MacBook Pro instead, because that has the fan which prevents the CPU from throttling, from slowing down under load, and that will have more of an impact, I think, on intensive workflows than 16 gig of RAM. It's worth bearing in mind that the M1 MacBook Air, in fact, all of the M1 machines, go up to two terabytes of storage, which is just huge. It's a huge amount of storage. It's an $800 option. <laughs> And this is where you start to look at the, the Apple prices for additional storage, and it becomes quite clear that if you actually look for a third-party option, you can save yourself an awful lot of money. It does mean that you'll be carrying around a spare hard drive, you know, external hard drive like I do with a, with a SanDisk, but as long as you get a decent external SSD with a really fast read and write speed, it will work great, to be honest. The only thing I would recommend is if you are the sort of person who does a lot of work out on the road and doesn't want to carry around hard drives, and works with big files. So if you work with, for example, a lot of video, then upgrading the storage probably makes sense because you can just put everything on, on the MacBook and then offload it onto external storage when you're finished with it. I do that, or I used to do that with my 16 inch MacBook Pro, which is the one terabyte version. But for everyone else, 256 gig of storage is absolutely fine. Now I think with Apple Care, Care Plus, there are two things, two schools of thought really. The first one is, is if this is a business purchase, so if it's something you're gonna to use to make money, I think Apple Care Plus, which is $229, not cheap, but I do think in that instance, it's an absolute no-brainer. It gives you peace of mind that you've got three years warranty over the standard 12 months, and also you get priority support from the Apple Care people who are really good. If this is gonna be a personal machine, I'll be totally honest, and people may tell me off in the comments for this, but I think if $229 is a lot of money for you, and it is a lot of money, I would think twice about buying the Apple Care Plus. I'd perhaps put that to one side and use it for something else. In my experience, MacBooks last for ages. We're thankfully beyond the problems with the previous keyboard. The chassis they use, you know, it's been around since 2016, so it's been around an awful long time. It will just last, it really will. You might be unlucky, you may have issues, but again, the Genius Bar guys, they're, they're pretty good when you go in, um, and you, it's not that expensive to get things replaced if you need to, but it's, that was such a rare thing anyway. So basically, business purchase, Get Apple Care Plus, it's a good investment. If you are a conscientious personal computer user and you're being very budget conscious, which I totally understand, don't lose too much sleep over not getting Apple Care because this laptop is built very, very well. So in conclusion, the M1 MacBook Air, Apple does not make it easy to buy, I don't think, because of this weird seven core, eight core GPU thing. But just to reiterate, don't worry about it. it. Honestly, you will not notice a difference at all, unless you're a gamer. Again, please go and check that if that's the case. The only things I would prioritize when you are potentially up upgrading this machine is the RAM, but even that eight gig is pretty, pretty solid, and potentially the storage. Those two things, think about that far more over that seven core versus eight core GPU. That's where you wanna put your money. Put your money into the RAM or the storage. That's m far more important. And just don't lament the things that you can't afford. It's no problem. If you don't wanna upgrade or can't upgrade to the highest spec M1 Air, it doesn't actually matter anymore. I think it did in the days of Intel, which still exist obviously, it did matter to a degree if you couldn't upgrade the RAM because you'd probably regret that in future. I genuinely think with the new M1 chips, we're in this different era now where that isn't really gonna be the case. Now, if you're starting to think that you might be better off with the M1 MacBook Pro, or you might even be tempted by the M1 Mac Mini, I am putting guides together for those as well. When they become available, I'll add them to the video description, so take a look there. In the meantime, if you want a more in-depth review of the M1 MacBook Air, I will leave a link to my two-week experience of that computer at the end of this video, so keep watching for that. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next video.